too much of uh, uh, progress because of a lot of inherent problems. Like, you know, uh, we had two talks uh, in the last uh, two sessions. One was an uh, experimental polymer science man, and the other was a theoretical physicist. And of course, they could speak a lot of common language together, fortunately. But usually what happens is that uh, this kind of domain are usually on the chemist domain. And then the modeling and thing are not actually the chemist's uh, cup of tea. When you say chemists, they are very proudly claiming that they are synthetic chemists, right? Uh, uh, now in almost 80 to 90 percent of them are uh, synthetic. Of course, uh, the computational chemistry area has come up quite uh, well in the last uh, decade or so. I am not saying that all chemists are doing only uh, synthesis analysis, but mostly they are synthesis. So you can always brand a chemist as an experimentalist right away, right? So uh, the idea, so what has happened is that uh, this idea of modeling and trying to understand the, uh, the, the physics behind it or the, the contraction mechanism or the switching mechanisms has not been their main domain. They have been making wonderful uh, materials which have been giving this kind of behavior, but they are not able to uh, sustain and look at it. And then what happens is that like there are certain inherent problems in this kind of uh, uh, thing. For example, when you make uh, uh, a polymeric material with quantum dots is that. Okay, uh, like in the morning, in the in the course of uh, Sabu Thomas discussion, also we had this. Uh, like, how much of this nanoparticle can you put in a polymer? That's a very serious problem. Like, you know, like you know, and the same polymer, for example, polyvinyl alcohol. If you go and ask for polyvinyl alcohol, uh, I go and ask you to buy it. The first thing you'll, you'll ask me is, uh, you'll go and look at. You say there are ten of them. Which one I should buy? Because you get them with different molecular weights. Starting from 20,000 down to 120,000. Okay. So and then their property do vary, and the amount of dispersion of this particular nanoparticle you can have in this polymer will also change with their molecular weight. So it's it's not a very easy thing. So what people are done is that they are taken some polymer, mix something, and then they look for this action, and they are shown that yes, this particular device is showing you this switching behavior, and I have a polymer based reaction. But somebody else wants to do it, he gets an entirely different kind of behavior plan because he has not followed the same procedure correctly. So this is the catch we are facing and that's where actually uh, I feel that a lot of research is required. Okay, a lot of uh, inputs can come from, from very, very simple and small places like the Pro University itself. And so it's not a big deal for you to do it because I may tell you how to make it. If you know how to make it, anyone can go and start in a lab today itself, provided all the material. How do you do that basically is that we start with the substrate, usually we use a ITO coated glass plate. Indium tin oxide is a conducting material. Usually for when you want to make any uh, uh, any, any device with the, on which you can make an electrode on top of that, then it's, it's the simplest is to have a glass on top of that ITO. So if you want a 25 mm by 25 mm ITO, it is manufactured and available in India. You can get 100 less than 500 rupees per per piece. It's not a very costly thing for anyone to buy. Okay. And you buy one piece, you can make four samples. You can make in that okay. because we always very we always cut into four pieces and make around 10 m of each. Okay, so and then what you do is that I have to make this active layer. Maybe a poly may not work with the same poly from another company. So this is the kind of the the, the, the real situation that uh, challenges people are facing. And usually how it happens is that okay, this one is uh, another type of uh, behavior where it is not used for uh, DRAM. Uh, behavior because it does not revert back to the other state. Now usually this switching mechanism consists of a filament formation. As you can see here, uh, with, with a low voltage and you reach a, a threshold voltage, there is a contacting filament kind of thing formed here. And when you actually uh, uh, further go, uh, reduce uh, reduce the voltage, this thing slowly disappears. Okay, This filament goes away. This goes in a reversible way, that's how this switching occurs from the uh, high resistance state to the low resistance state continuously. How much time I have, sir? Time is over. Time is over. We take two minutes. Okay. Fine. Right. So one has to understand the contraction mechanism in this. That's where the, the whole problem comes. Well, there are plenty of contraction I don't want to bore you with the equations. I will leave my slide behind. So any of you is interested, you can use this. That's not a big deal. Huh? Can, uh, I don't have any proprietary rights on these slides. So you can take them. Okay. So there are plenty of uh, mechanisms here because the way, uh, for example, you take here, this switching how it occurs from here to here, it follows a path, you see, and this path is not the same in both the cases. 
So there, and this actually is called the conduction mechanism that is leading to the switching. And that is very important for them to understand, to understand what is the, the mechanism that leads to the switching. Okay? So in fact, this particular part, uh, what the on and off state people are kind of trying to look at, and there are many models available. Okay? Because it is very simple. All you have to do is empirically you have to find out which form fits you much better. Then you know that that's the model you are into. Okay. So that's how most of the reports right now are working. They are only looking at they're trying to fit it to the best possible one of the models and saying that the conduction mechanism is this and is going to that. Okay. Okay. So these are some of the whereas you know there are certain uh, organic when you come to these organic materials you know both this type of things are available, this kind of bipolar switching and monopolar kind of switching. Okay? And there are two, three models available. People are talking about different ways by which this particular thing can occur. One says that it's simply the, the charge trapping in a nanoparticle. Other says this is electric uh, field induced movement of these uh, uh, charges through the system. Okay? But all of them talking about the, how the charge is moving in this system. And there is no such thing, such thing called a, a standard theory or a, suppose I say a, a particular polymer, a biopolymer and a particular nanomaterial, a metallic particle in that, which one, uh, what type of a mechanism should it follow? Well, there is no such rule. That is the biggest problem and you have to find out yourself, I mean you can't use the law and then apply it to it and then try to find out. You have to make your own, uh, uh, because the amount of data available for you to compare and do also is very, very less. This is an area which is developing. And that's why you know, nobody can predict whether it's going to be a bipolar or a unipolar or what kind of conduction mechanic it will have. So that's what the status is all about. Okay? But you know what, <coughs> see, this is an example of that. You can see, I, I could find about 35 papers on about 35 different systems so far that the publication is all about. That's kind of very small compared to any area that is developing. All you have to do is look for zinc oxide. Eh? You run about a uh, uh, number of Papers were published will be hundreds and hundreds and uh, it may be going to thousand or so. Okay. Whereas in this one you find hardly hundred hundred papers uh, hardly there. And none of them have the same conduction mechanism or, or the uh, type of switching mechanism. So this is something very, very funny and strange because nobody has really now taken the bull by the horns to kind of tame it. Okay. So a lot of uh, work to be done in this. Okay. And there's a lot of things like, like we were working on one simple system. And uh, we are lucky to get a very high uh, uh, order of ratio that is almost 10 of 7 orders we got. So it, we are actually quite Okay. Uh, so this is the kind of scope this area has. I mean, you make one material and then you end up getting into pattern. I mean, it does not happen in almost any, in almost all the materials possible. Okay. So what I am trying to say is that there is plenty of scope in this area and the requirements for the experiment to do it or prepare these materials are very, very meager. Okay. And the only thing is you need a very systematic way of looking at it and studying it. And the only other equipment you require is a, uh, is a source meter, SMU. Uh, that costs about uh, 5 lakhs. Okay. You don't require anything more than a kidney so, uh, source meter SMU. Uh, it's all you have to buy. For, for other, Agilent Town has uh, equivalent one. Okay. Both these companies sell this. Okay. So I think I am almost coming to the end of it. This is a very promising non volatile uh, computer the biomedical side being looked at. Uh, there is a race between these two, PC RAM, I tell you, and this uh, uh, RERAM. I do not know which is going to really win the battle because uh, they are running neck to neck now. Okay? Only time will tell. But this area of having a biodegradable polymer and trying to build a RAM, RERAM is going to be very useful and if we really want to move towards this biodegradable memories. And in that sense, there are again a lot of promises here, but a yes, lot of work has to be done to understand and optimize this and somebody has to say okay you have an X polymer and a Y nanoparticle you want to make a composite and make then you should give this particular property this bit of switching that kind of situation we are not reached so far so that's where the nascent stage of this particular area is so we need a lot of inputs a lot of research to go on so that and so I am thinking of you know a lot of papers a lot of thesis in this area okay only then we will be able to reach the stage okay and uh, the challenge of course is what what to take on because uh, the, the fruits are very sweet. And uh, this is all actually I want to talk about and I take questions now. The talk is now full for discussion. filament. The one I showed is for actually the inorganic wraps. There what happened? 
Any other question? Yes, Professor Okay, thank you, sir. So that is a token tweet from the organizer of ICMS 2020. So I would request your person, sir, to hand over the token. properties or uh, parameters which we should look for while trying to make uh, any device out of that. And uh, I will also discuss, uh, if time permits, uh, show two of the results that we have done in our own lab, two of all what we are still pursuing. So to start with, just a brief introduction and uh, maybe a repetition of what we have already heard. We are talking about material for flexible devices. So uh, just uh, for us, what are flexible devices? What do we understand by that? So it is uh, as uh, all the examples that we have had till now, like mobile phones, TFTs, all LEDs, etc. All these come up in a certain framework, right? How nice would it be if I could have it on something which I could fold and keep it in my purse and take it out as and when I require? So if uh, such a thing has to come up, then definitely we need to have something which is flexible which is not rigid. We are talking of such kind of material here and which on uh, the material should be such which should have the property, all the semiconducting properties that we have, that we are looking for. As well, it should have the flexibility to be portable, to be carried to different places and to be used as and when required. So we should have the material which can have the circuits as well, electronic circuits on it, it should not be rigid and in this category we find mostly our polymers which fit in. They should also be highly stable, easy to manufacture and non-toxic. Again, when I talk of flexible electronics, I should have the material such that I can print the electronics onto it, the circuitry onto it. So I should not be having uh, another component like I have synthesized a film and then Apart from that, I also carry a big gadget to amplify the signals and all. So it would be a very wonderful idea if I could have one particular team film on one side, I can print all the uh, circuitry to it and keep on using it as a gadget. So just uh, as Professor Srinivasan said that if I could have it like a SIM card. So I have a particular film, I design the circuitry on one side of it, insert it and I'm ready to go as for any device of my choice. That kind of something. As we see here, this is a picture taken from the internet. So here we have uh, some sensors here. This is a material and there are some circuitry, which is again flexible. So my material, my device, we are talking, we are going to discuss about this material on which we can do such kind of circuitry. These are some other examples. We have these, uh, some solar cell-like patterns, which are flexible. We have these, uh, something called E-scale. If we, these are all uh, data from the internet, so nothing much about it. E-scan is something which would be very sensitive. Basically, it is a gas sensor, it's a pressure sensor, all combined together. So like our scale, if, uh, if somebody pricks us, we can uh, get that sensation. Similarly, and if it is your E-scan, it will also give you a signal, which can be amplified and again uh, used for, so, uh, ampli uh, using that signal into certain uh, responses. Now, we are talking of freestanding films. So the films that I've been showing you, the results of which, they do not have any substrate. They are basically substrate-less film, just like uh, some kind of sheet that you see, some transparency, and they'll be very flexible. That, that means you can take it off, and you can fold it, and you can do uh, whatever work we are talking about. So this way, just as a comparison for the students out here, like if we have so inorganic structures of semiconductors, we have some rigid structures, periodicity, etc. Whereas when we transfer it to some organic semiconductor, we lose that. 
and we'll have some random orientation of a bunch of molecules kept together. Accordingly, we'll have some kind of advantages and disadvantages also. So for organic uh, semiconductors, we have they are very lightweight, they're flexible. We prefer them to be biodegradable, but there can be others as well. And they have uh, the synthesis uh, will be a large scale one, upgradable, scalable. It is low cost. That means very uh, less input is required to synthesize such things. Again, the electronics that we are developing on these, they also do not need much uh, vacuum processing. Very less in terms of uh, this uh, lithographic printing means you can have bulk production. So accordingly, per device, your uh, cost comes down to very less actually. Since there are no substrates, we can have them on plastic, on paper, and uh, I remember somewhere, I have also read that in DRDO we are using such cloth as well. So there is one particular polymer, I forget the name exactly, it is used in the bulletproof jackets now. So this is the level of uh, application that we have of such uh, uh, material. Now how do they work? This is uh, something like, I have taken this example for our simple carbon-carbon bonding with hydrogen. So here we have, uh, as we see here, there are some sigma bonding here which is very strong and we have some pi bonding. And these pi bondings are usually very uh, less stronger, right? So these are the ones which will be helping in carrying out the electronic transitions. And if I were to look into the energy diagram also, I will find that in between these two, whatever uh, excitation I can give by giving some uh, external energy in terms of optical or whatever, this is what is going to uh, transfer into the response that we are looking for. Exploiting these things only, if, if uh, Sir has already talked about the charge carrier transport, basically we, on all these films, we talk about this band transport or a hopping transport. Other uh, transport mechanisms are also uh, available, but these are the ones which are uh, most often being used in this one. But these are certain drawbacks also in the polymers which you are having. They have very high resistance and so conductivity is extremely poor. Right? Because of this we will have lesser bandwidth for uh, device application. We have poor efficiency of the devices that we develop. And we also have, we require very high operating voltage to start the function as well. Here we have a new class of compounds, not a new one which has already already uh, been done by various scientists, organic semiconductors with some inorganic dopants. So what we do basically is in the polymer matrix, we are not going, uh, going to give some fillers. Fillers as was discussed by Professor Thomas, the same thing, but really here they will be in very small quantity so as to be treated as dopants. This was the first paper on this uh, article, uh, on this uh, similar material, like electrical conductivity in doped polyesterine, published sometime in 1977. That means it's a, a very old subject. We are just reviving it now. In this, Professor Higa, Professor Magdiamid, and Professor Shirakawa, they had done, uh, increased the conductivity in uh, polyesterine by doping it with another conducting polymer. And they had, uh, this had fetched in the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 2000. Similar work, taking the clue from this thing only, now across the world, the scientists are working on it. We are using this uh, conductive P dot PSS polymer, and we are uh, doping this conductive polymer into various polymers. We are using inorganic dopants also into the polymers, and we are trying to do devices of this type. So this uh, script here. These are the various applications again of the polymers that we have, I was just talking about. And this is again uh, flexible uh, photovoltaics. As you see here, the flexibility of using polymers. Had it been a rigid device, uh, crumpling or buckling them like this is not possible. Because it is flexible, we can transfer it to any uh, substrate, any type of uh, geometry, wherever we feel like. And we can again extract the same efficiency out of it. Now here one more thing I would like to say, because it is flexible, we can again compress it or stretch it also. So the stretch also changes the uh, dimensions and the vicinity of the various uh, molecules in my polymers. Uh, accordingly, the electronic configuration changes and changing its efficiency. 
the properties of the polymer. So if you see, look at this graph, this is IV curve for this particular material. So wherever we have compressed it, you see the uh, uh, change in the value of the current for the same uh, amount of voltage applied. So this is the stretched part, this is the compressed part. This kind of variation also helps because uh, if we were to make such photovoltaics and place it on rooftop and imagine we have a ridge somewhere on the roof edge or at the center of the roof it is, then if we were to place it, we would be having buckling of the polymer, polymer sheet. And in that case, such compression or uh, such a stretching of the polymer is quite obvious. In such cases, we can expect this kind of changes uh, in the output of the material. Similarly, these materials are also used for gas sensor in which so in this case, your target gas is being uh, absorbed. It diffuses through your polymer, changes its dielectric properties, and based on the circuitry changes, such things can be done uh, in, uh, with a, this roller kind of mechanism. You can just roll sheets of such polymers. These are again pressure sensors, like what we said earlier. You can just apply it on your um, body somewhere and your touch sensors, your doorbells, your alarm bells, all these actually work on similar kind of principle. H having said this, there is something which uh, early we, morning in the keynote uh, address we were discussing, like how does uh, the amount of uh, nanoparticles that are incorporated or the fillers, how much, what is the quantity that actually affects actually we understand that the polymer is something, uh, it could be like this, an arrangement where you have a particular shell of the polymer, your fillers along with some other polymer inside. This could be one mechanism, which means I have doped the inner polymer. Yeah. Dope syntoxide. Because uh, why I asked this question is, uh, yeah. can we also read our application? The pure decoxide inner the that produces. No. We never tried to. That may be that the it may that be a part yeah, help. We'll take that into account. Yeah. Other yes. thing is, uh, can you just tell me something about this B, B dot uh, PSS? Yeah. Is it the bidegrid? I'm sorry, I, no, I do not know that's why I It is water soluble, it is bidegrid. So thank you madam for your presentation. Now I would request the chairperson Dr. Ashok Kumar to hand over the token gift on behalf of the organizing committee ICMS 2020. Thank you, sir. By Mr. Shishendu Mitra from the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Guwahati. I invite Dr. Mitra, Mr. Mitra, 
specialist on functioning but in case of some pathogenic infection or some biochemical uh, uh, biochemical changes there might be some problems inside the body and that can lead to some unhealthy situations and that uh, in, in any kind of unhealthy situation the things are uh, the few components are either over expressed or under expressed in those body fluids like tr saliva blood sweat and urine so uh, our target is to detect a particular component which can tell about a certain mal condition of the body from those biological fluids so for for testing uh, different mal functioning from these biological fluids people have developed several qoct that is point of care testing devices in point of care testing devices uh, uh, why do we use this point of care testing device because it saves time to detect some uh, component it is uh, uh, it can give you urgent quick results and it is also it is also portable and hand handed we can carry it anywhere to detect a particular thing and also uh, world health organization has uh, told that it has to be any qoct device has to be affordable sensitive uh, specific and uh, robust user friendly equipment free and deliverable and in short uh, we call it assured so the first letter from all the uh, all this criteria so there are various point of care testing devices currently available in the market which we use for detecting many problems uh, and those are Uh, this one is very uh, popular glucose glucometer we regularly use for detecting over expression of glucose in serum uh, blood serum uh, hemoglobin testing devices blood pressure monitoring devices breast ketone analyzer pregnancy uh, kit uh, along with that there are thermometer malaria uti and urinary tract infection testing devices dengue kit etc so now we have to understand the sensing techniques of the various qoct devices so whatever qoct devices i have talked uh, talked on so those devices are uh, based on either chemi resistive electrochemical calorimetric and semiconductive devices so those are the uh, main protocols to test various things in biological bo biological body fluids uh, so in chemi resistive device what do we do there is a chemi resistor in presence of suppose you put serum sample on this chemi resistor if there is something over expressed that that resistance will be change, uh, changing accordingly and we can detect the same in electrochemical we have three electrodes three standardized electrodes working reference and uh, 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 and uh, uh, counter electrode so in this cases uh, electrochemistry is being exploited you know in order to calibrate certain material so in calorimetry what do we do we do some specific reaction that changes some color and because of that color change we can detect some certain mal condition of the body uh, accordingly uh, semiconductor devices are available where uh, iv characteristics and other changes gives the calibration term so coming to my work so in this particular study i have I have worked on ketones and glucose in urine samples. So generally, people do glucose testing in blood serum, which is very popular. But people do not uh, nowadays even medical practitioners do not prescribe to do test of acetone and uh, and um, uh, glucose in uh, urine sample. And that is, uh, but this uh, ketone and glucose testing in urine sample is very much important because this ketones and glucose are interlinked. and that is why in this particular work we have targeted to detect acetone and ketone from urine sample so the, the uh, basic chemistry we have exploited in case of ketone we have reacted it in alkaline media we have reacted in sodium nitrobuside and did that gives a specific pink color so according to the concentration of the ketone in urine or aqueous solution the color intensity changes and we calibrated that color inter intensity in order to detect the amount of ketone in urine sample or in aqueous sample similarly a particular reaction which is very uh, common and uh, old reaction that is benedic test for glucose we have exploited this test where uh, benedic reagent reacts with glucose and uh, this copper plus 2 converts into copper cuprous oxide and that has a color it gives a different color in urine sample so from there we have we have we, we can calibrate uh, i will quickly tell the relation between uh, glucose and ketones so in type 1 diabetes there are uh, problem Uh, 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 in this case, uh, insulin is not there. Insulin is a component that transfers glucose from bloodstream to the cell, and cell needs glucose because it has to have, uh, it has to produce energy. That energy which is required for any activity we are doing. 
So if insulin is not there, that glucose cannot be transferred from the bloodstream to the cell. So that is a problem. In case of type 2 diabetes, insulin is there, but the thing is, insulin cannot function properly. It, uh, it, it, it fails to transfer the uh, glucose molecules from bloodstream to, uh, to the cells. So in these particular cases, uh, in a glucose cannot be used for having energy. So in that cases, uh, what, uh, what body does, it takes uh, fat or other materials and it burns fat and during the burning of fat, ketones are produced. So the link, link is we are tested in urine. So as I told, the, the reaction with the uh, uh, sodium nitrate, those are the colors we have obtained. Uh, this is from aqueous solution. We have created different concentration of acetone solution and we have, uh, we have generated the color and this is the color. For glucose, this is the color change with different concentration. Similar thing we have done in urine sample. In urine sample also we have got one gradient of color, here the pink color. And in case of glucose, there are several colors which we have obtained uh, in urine sample. Cultural evening of ICMS 2020. Tripura has always been known to be a land of pristine peace and coexistence of diverse communities. Varied culture of tribal and non-tribal people of this state forms the backbone of Tripura's culture. This is reflected as much in the rhythmic physical movements of Hodagiri dance of young community as in the collective musical instruments and devotional songs known as bhajan of non-tribal communities. With this, uh, let us welcome Srimati Palami Roy for today's first performance. She is going to perform a bhajan sangeet. Also, Parminder ma'am to get this opportunity. <coughs> My first presentation is a uh, one rag mala, which is uh, three ragas on base, <coughs> rag Shurini, then rag Jhonpuri, and last <coughs> rag Yaman. And my second presentation is one gazal which was sung by Asha Bhosleji.
for the strings of our heart by his performance with violin.
says Mr. Devajuti Lasper for a wonderful performance. Next, uh, our performance is a famous dance from Rigyan Rai community known as Hozakiri. Uh, meanwhile, they are preparing this stage. I have few announcements for tomorrow's schedule. Tomorrow, poster session will start at 2.30 p.m. I request all the delegates, those who have poster presentation, kindly put your poster in the poster area at morning during the breakfast time only. And judgment will be done during 2.30 to 3.45 p.m. So be present in front of your posters during that time. Next is regarding the tour. Uh, uh, those who are is interested for the local tour, we will uh, keep one list inside the hall with the names. Please mark your names so uh, we will uh, arrange accordingly. Now, let us welcome a group dance performance directed by Mr. Ranjit Priyank, known as Kojagiri.